Hello, I'm Malcolm Hazlitt. Martin Hasey is the chair of the Premier's Climate Change Council. He's the chief executive officer of Business SA, a founding member of the Australian Broadband Advisory Council, and is writing a book on why personal and business reinvention is essential for success in today's ever-changing world. And he's our special guest next on Our Time. And welcome to our time. Our very special guest in this program is, can we call you an ex-Lord Mayor of Adelaide? You can. Well, I can because you were. But is ex the right title? Do you have another? There is no former title. An um, ex-right honourable? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right dishonourable. Right dishonourable because you're naughty now. Martin, thank you very much for coming in for a chat. Thank because you. Because your life and career is just fascinating. Can we start with your parents? Because your father... He began as a lawyer and became a high court judge. My father had a really interesting kind of story. Uh, he was born in a, a regional town in South Australia called Waichakawi. I know Waichakawi. You do? I do. And uh, it's near Tarawi. It's yes. in the Jamestown, Jamestown district in South Australia in the mid-north. Um, they, have a fa- they have a very uh, well-organised theatre group there, believe it or not. Do they? Yes, the Waichakawi players. Is that right? Well, my grandfather used to own the local pub. Right. And so my father boarded in Adelaide, went to law school, became a lawyer and then became a judge on the Industrial Court of South Australia and then went on to become a um, judge of the Family Court of Australia, which is a federal court. And your mum? Mum, uh, my father passed away very young too, I must say. And uh, so mum was the real stalwart of the family for many, many years and she only passed away this year. So mum was kind of the matriarch of a very large, actually, extended family because my my father, his sister, had ten children and it was a very big kind That's of... a big family. A big Catholic family. And um, so mum was really the matriarch of a kind of a big group of people. Was that, was your father's inspiration and mum being such a good organiser to keep everybody working and happily together, was that what sort of pushed you into the areas that you've been in? I think it must have been. I think we're all influenced by our parents and our upbringing. Well, of course, yes. So... Um, well, they give you a basic foundation, don't they, really? They do. I mean, my father was very hardworking and... And my, so are you. And my mother was very organised. So I think I organized, I got both. Yes, you did. And um, so it was, you know, the garden, you know, I'm very fortunate. Okay. Well, I love the story because reading about you, um, your first business enterprise didn't quite work out as you wanted it to. I've had a really interesting commercial career. <laughs> um, when I was very young, I studied property when I left school. Right. And I worked briefly in real estate. But I kind of got involved in a whole range of things. And one of them was uh, 19, mid-1980s. And this was pre the internet. Um, I, invested, I invested into a local South Australian company which could have invented basically the World Wide Web. It was extraordinary what they were doing. It was very innovative. It was way ahead of its time. Um, anyway, let's say that one didn't work and it wasn't because it was a bad idea. It was just bad timing. Yeah. Um, but then I went into retail and my first shop was in the Brickworks Market uh, in Adelaide and many people would remember the Brickworks Market yes. very fondly. Well, it's sort of a bit of it's still there, isn't it? Just a bit. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is. The old kiln, I think, is mm. still there. And, uh, and then I opened up a retail store in the city and uh, that was a youth clothing store called Youthworks. Now, that was innovative because? It was very different. For that time, it was remarkably different. It was kind of like the first streetwear store in Adelaide. In mm-hmm. fact, it was one of the first streetwear stores in Australia. And that grew quite rapidly because in a number of short years, I had 18 stores across. Was that a surprise? Um, I was learning on the job, Malcolm. It yeah. was a big surprise and it was a very steep learning curve. So uh, the fir- this opening up the second store I think was the hardest because you can't be in two places at once. Yes. Um, and so then- you were physically in the store to begin with? I was very hands-on Yeah. Uh, for, for many, many, many yep. years. I mean it grew to a reasonably sized business. We had about 250 employees at one point. And not just in South Australia? Uh, right across Adelaide, right across Melbourne. Mm-hmm. So we didn't venture beyond South Australia or Victoria, but I would be moving between both very frequently. It's hard to let go of that, though, when it's your baby. It is. Um, 
I, in the latter years of that business, I owned that business kind of outright for a long time, but in the latter years I had a business partner and we were made an offer in about 2006 and, um, and I was still relatively young at that point in time. I kind of thought that I'd still be doing it for many years thereafter. And, uh, but in retail, offers don't come around very often, I must say. And my business partner said, look, we really should look at this. And uh, we ultimately did and we sold out. But that gave you the opportunity to move on to become the Lord Mayor. It did a few years later. Yes. Um, but was the experience that you gleaned, you gleaned working in the city of Adelaide and dealing with business people around you, was that sort of the beginning of it? Was that the inspiration to stand? The inspiration to stand for public life came relatively late, but the experience I gathered along the way came relatively early. Right. Because if I wind the clock right back, my, my first job in retail was on Rundle Mall in 1980. So I, I worked <laughs> for David Jones, I worked for Country Road. I worked uh, for Myers. You worked for Myers? Well done. For four years from the age of 16. Well done. Uh, and so I, I just learned a lot of things. And I'm kind of a bit of an advocate for the retail sector because you learn how to deal with people. And no matter what you do in life, you've got to deal with Absolutely people. Absolutely right. You know, I was singing at the Wonderland Ballroom and the owner of the ballroom, Bob Christie, I've actually not said this on this program, uh, he said to me, I was still at high school in Mount Barker, and he said to me, so if you want to be a singer, you have to learn how to handle people, how to handle money and how to handle or, and have knowledge of men's fashion. And he said, I've arranged a job at the Myer Emporium so you can do all that. He took me in. Really? I started work the next day. That's great. What, what are the opportunities or the chances for kids today to do that or, in fact, for somebody to mentor to do that? Well, that's another thing, isn't it, that mentors are so important. Absolutely. And sometimes you don't always appreciate that at the time. But well, if you, you can't look, because you haven't had the experience of life. You look back and it was like transformational. So, mm. you know, that advice you got and the advice that I got from my mentors along the journey, mm. um, I mean, if you'd asked me when I was younger whether I'd be the Lord Mayor of Adelaide, I mean, I wouldn't have believed you. So Didn't um, fancy the gold chain? No. <laughs> got a great shot of you here with the gold chain around your neck. Yes. Um, these shots are rather special because who's the you've got a um, a band with you. Do you remember that? Uh, that's the City of Adelaide Pipes Band. Oh, of course it is. So um, And your wife. And that's Genevieve, my wife. So yes, that's that's a job that comes with jewellery. So <laughs> when you're the when you're the Lord <laughs> yes. Mayor of Adelaide. It's so, heavy, isn't it? It is heavy. Well that's there are two chains. Um, there's the original chain and there's the contemporary chain. And this one here? That's the more contemporary chain. Right. The original chain actually is extremely heavy. Just um, with your wife there, but the statue between the two of you, she seems to be missing something. Uh, my wife, bottom. My wife or the statue? No, the statue. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, your wife is missing you probably because you're busy all the time. Right. But this statue, I'd not seen this before. So, Did you organise this? Uh, that's a statue of Queen Adelaide and uh, it's another great story, Malcolm, because Adelaide is really the only, certainly the first city in the world named after a woman. I didn't know that. Yes, it is. And uh, it was named after, of course, Queen Adelaide. Mm -hmm. And um, she was a trailblazer. So the, the kindergarten was her invention. She was German. Really? Her name was Adelheid. Oh, of course. Of course, that was the German monarchy moving through, wasn't That's it? That's right. Right. And um, she brought the kindergarten concept or she created the kindergarten right. concept in the UK. And then, of course, it went through the British Empire. Uh, she was an extraordinarily strong advocate for children. It's brilliant. I never knew that. Mm. But but that that statue or sculpture, where did that come from? So that was uh, sculpted by a local South Australian sculptor called Scott Eames. Mm -hmm. And Scott sculpted that and I bought it, or Gene Genevieve and I bought it, and we donated it to the City of Adelaide. Yes. So it's still in Town Hall. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. That's mm. what I was hoping you'd mm. say, that bit, mm. that last bit. So um, becoming the Lord Mayor, was that a real challenge or did you just see that as a natural progression to be able to assist? I did it to serve. Quite genuinely, it was the kind of retailer in me that motivates me to do a lot of things in my life. I had managed Rundle Mall, so I'd worked for City Council for about three and a half years right. prior to being Lord Mayor. 
And for a couple of years prior to that, I'd been on the board of one of the city council organisations. So I certainly had a reasonable appreciation. Were of you a councillor first? No. You, so you went straight through to Lord Mayor? And I was told, and I must say I didn't know it at the time, but uh, I was the first person to ever do that. Yes, I, I knew that bit. So, um, and I think if someone had told me that when I was on the campaign trail, I probably, <laughs> probably would have had a meltdown. Yes. Happen, but why am I doing this? Why, why, so, why? Um, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, ignorance makes you a bit fearless. Well, it does, and probably that's why people are successful because... Mm. If you think of all the cons, you won't think of all the pros. The cons will outweigh the pros. I think that's a wonderful analogy. If you, if you think about all the reasons why you can't or shouldn't do something, you won't do it. A, a famous entrepreneur once said to me, um, when you're young, you have no fear because you frankly don't know what could happen. Mm. When you're older, you know what bankruptcy is mm. and you sort of, oh, no, I won't go there. Mm. But what opportunities we can miss out on if we don't? Oh, I totally agree. So yeah. finishing up as Lord Mayor must have been difficult because obviously you would have had things in train ready to sort of happen in the future because nothing happens instantly. Mm. Um, was that difficult to let go? It was, um, but you're the custodian of that role. You don't mm. own it. Mm. Um, and it's not a, an elected with the public position. It, it, it oh, is. is it? Yes, no, it certainly is. It, it, it's a directly elected position. Oh, okay. Um, it's not a role which is appointed by the council. Um, right, but it's not appointed by the government of the day it's, as it's, such. It's not a party-based role. Um, it, you, you run as an individual, you do the job as an individual and then you work with your fellow elected members of the day right. and I was there from 2014 to 2018 and um, I hope that we got, you know, quite a number of things done to improve. Well, you certainly city. did. You achieved a great deal. When Sandy took over, I think she's followed through quite a few of the things. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in a moment because some of the stories that Martin has been involved with and the things that he has said in train have been absolutely fantastic. So we'll be back in a tick. Our special guest is former Lord Mayor of Adelaide and now we're about to talk about some exciting things that Martin Hasey is working with and on, particularly the Business Council. So how did this happen? In May 2019, I joined as Chief Executive of Business SA, which is the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Malcolm. And right. it's, it's a body which has been in South Australia for many years now. I had no idea that it was around for so long. Just inform us this year, this date, I find extraordinary. So Business SA traces its origins back to 1839. Isn't that amazing? It's a great story in itself and it's, we think it's the first Chamber of Commerce in Australia. That's incredible. That is incredible. It says a lot about South Australia too. So at a time like this with the COVID issue that everyone's suffering from and businesses are definitely suffering because people can't go out and buy things, mm. how do you help? We do three things principally and we are an organisation who has several thousand members. We work across the city, we work across metropolitan Adelaide and right around regional and rural South Australia. And we work across all industries. So we're quite literally working across 17 industry sectors. I've got about 60 staff. We're based on Green Hill Road, but we've also got staff located around the state. Mm -hmm. We principally do three things, Malcolm. We do advocacy work. So we advocate for and on behalf of business owners right. around the state. And we do that with state governments, federal governments, local governments, and even sometimes industry to industry. We do uh, gross so services. In simple terms, that's just connecting really connecting somebody who needs something from either local government or national government? At a bigger scale. Right. So for those issues which businesses need support, and in the context of the last kind of 17 or 18 months with COVID, businesses have needed a lot of advocacy. So we talk to government about policy and we talk about many South Australians would know, of course, recently the state government, the treasurer, announced a business support package as a result of a recent lockdown. Mm -hmm. Well, Business SA worked very closely with Treasury on that outcome. We helped model it. Right. We, uh, right. we so helped them that's put the rules where it in came place. From. Absolutely. Right, right, right. 
<laughs> it's the same thing in Victoria because this program goes to Victoria as well. Yes, so there's the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry right. and uh, I speak with their chief executive very regularly, as recently as today, and they're doing similar work with their state government in Victoria. Right. So, But we're all members of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry based in Canberra and that's an advocacy group who's really spending a lot of time in the halls of Parliament House in Canberra. So we're members of ACI, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, so is the Victorian Chamber. So we're part of a national network. I love acronyms like that. Lots of acronyms. Because when you see it, you think, what on earth is that? That's yes. right. Um, but we also help businesses with services that help them grow, digital literacy training, uh, entrepreneurship, strategy, consulting and advisory. We do migration work. We do business brokerage work. Uh, we deliver a federal government program which advises kind of some business owners about growth potential in their organisation. Right. We do quite a lot. Because the issue is some people know how to do, uh, how to make something or how to, how to formulate the new direction that that's moving in, but they don't have the ability or the knowledge as to how to sell it in, in simple terms. That's true. Um, Business is just becoming more complex. Yes. Um, if you're a business owner, the expectation you, is, isn't it? you've got to be thinking about things like cyber security. Mm. Now, that's not necessarily within the skill set, skill set mm. of mm. many South Australian business owners. So we run programs on how to protect your business from cyber security. We also do a lot of work around industrial relations so that we, we help employers uh, be responsible employers to make sure that they uh, are working with the awards, working with common law employment agreements and a whole range of things. And if you're a business owner, as you know, Malcolm, you've got to be a bit of a jack of all trades. Absolutely. But you need help and we help fill in the gaps. Right. Does that help you with the other advisory to um, government regarding climate change? It does to some degree, yes. So the other hat that I wear is uh, chair of the Premier's Climate Change Council and that's an organisation which has been in place in South Australia since 2008. And that's a policy group. So what we do, and there's a team of uh, nine people on the Premier's Climate Change Council, and they're all experts in their own area. Mm -hmm. We provide Cabinet, the Premier, uh, Minister David Spears in South Australia, with advice about climate change adaptation, climate change mitigation, and in many ways to enable the growth of low emissions industries in South Australia. And we're doing pretty well here. We are. Um, just great story to tell um, is that South Australia is quite literally leading the world in terms of the uptake of renewable energy. South Australia is literally leading the world in terms of the uptake of solar panels and PV on people's rooftops. Mm -hmm. um, South Australia is doing wonderful things in the circular economy, uh, single-use plastics. Um, it's, we it, were the first state, I think, to ban the plastic bags, weren't we? We were. Yeah. Um, we were the first state in the 1970s to put in container deposit legislation yes. on bottles and cans. It's so frustrating when you're in another part of the country and you, you're thinking, right, well, I need to do the right thing with this bottle. Oh, I can get five cents back on that. No, you can't, sort of thing. That's right. It surprises me, though, we haven't gone a little further, for example, with milk containers. Is that somewhere like, you know, the plastic that we get milk in, is that something that may be on the horizon? Well, I hope it is because I think there's also a really practical reason why Adelaide and South Australia is tidy. Is, oh, and yes. many people would credit that to the container deposit the, legislation yep. because you've put a price onto the rubbish. Yes. And then it can become something which is repurposed and recycled. And it's recycled by people often who need to earn that extra few dollars mm. by collecting the stuff, isn't it? Correct. It's and correct. that's a really interesting there, whether it's scouts mm. or or people just are frankly living on the street because sadly we still have that happening. We do. So uh, generally speaking, not that we can be complacent for one minute. No. Um, but South Australia is and I hope will continue to do well when it comes to um, mitigating and adapting to a climate change. And we've got a good track record. We've got years of expertise in this place. And there's a strong interrelationship now between the business community because of what their customers expect from them mm. and climate change. 
And in November this year, there'll be COP26, which is the United Nations Conference of Parties. And they have one every year, and it really does focus collectively the world's attention on important matters like climate change. Well, clearly that's been discussed a lot in the last few weeks. Um, it, it, are politicians behind the way that the public are feeling on this, do you think? It depends. Um, I, I must say with great confidence that the South Australian government is and the work plan for the Premier's Climate Change Council in the last two years has been vigorous. So we now have a uh, 2021 to 2025 climate change action plan, which has been endorsed by the Premier, by Cabinet. That's got 68 actions across government, which really uh, accelerate um, South Australia's response to climate change across a whole range of measures and a whole range of government departments and agencies. It really is quite material. Um, but there's also the collaboration with business. Mm. Because if, Malcolm, if we look what's happening in the kind of national and global business communities, at this point in time, certainly with bigger businesses, but it is changing and it's certainly beginning to impact smaller and medium-sized businesses, is that at a corporate level, there's a great deal of innovation. It's kind of the low emissions economy which we're moving into. Mm. Corporate Australia understands that. Corporate, corporate Australia sees that as an opportunity and if the environment is a winner, it really is a win-win. Yes, it's like building more um, coal-fired generators for electricity seems a bit sort of stupid now, even considering that or thinking that. No, I, it's a wonderful time to be alive on one hand and a frightening time to be alive on the other in a way, but we have the ability to fix it. Well, it's in our hands, isn't it? Yes, exactly. I mean, ultimately, if we don't fix it, Who's going to? Who's got, well, our children are going to suffer from it is the issue. Absolutely right. Why, why do you feel uh, the climate naysayers are, uh, is it a lack of education, do you think? Is it just pig-headedness to, you know, we'll do it our way and stuff the rest of you sort of thing? Malcolm, there are extremes on both sides of the climate debate, um, but I think most people are pretty sensible and most, most people are pretty pragmatic. Well, that's been proven with the COVID rollout of vaccine, I guess. Mm. I mean, people are madly scrambling to get the vaccine now. We don't have the issues that, say, the um, the lower part of America has, the, the lower states of America, with people just talking absolute rubbish. Mm. Uh, the, the, I mean, the climate debate is fascinating because we all read about it. Uh, it gets influenced by politics. It gets heavily influ in, uh, influenced by vested interest. It gets influenced by ideology. But they are both ends of the spectrum. Um, the sensible middle when it comes to climate change, I would say the vast, I think it's about 70% of Australians recognise climate change, realise we've got to do more to tackle yeah. climate change. And every year that number goes up. So the because sheer way we're seeing it. We're seeing it. We're seeing the result of it. We're seeing the bushfires. We're seeing the flooding. Extreme weather events. It's one of the, uh, we've always been told this for the last 10 years. Yes. That we will see an increase in extreme weather events and we're seeing them. Well, is it because the public, do you think, have lost trust of politicians because it seems that with the two major parties in this country, it seems that one is always poo-hooing the other, to put in common speak, rather than saying, I think they've got this right, we just need to tweak this. I mean, that's what ultimately ends up happening in most cases. But the divide seems to be great at the moment. More so at a national level than yes, a state, at, very much at a, a state level. Um, well, there's a bit of carry-on both in here in South Australia and in Victoria as well. Interestingly, not so much at a state level on the climate debate. No. There's a lot more bipartisanship in terms of the climate debate so at a state level, less so, so at a federal level. Yeah, so the question really has to be, so why don't we know more about that than we hear about the politicking? You know, the things that they're agreeing on, they're the things we need to hear about. Why do you think we don't hear enough about that? I totally agree. Um, sometimes disagreement... Maybe you need to go into politics. Sometimes disagreements are more newsworthy, Malcolm. Um, yes, and that's that's they, a they, real shame. They get more airtime. Yes. Um, Hold it. Speaking of airtime, we've run out of this particular segment, but we'll be back with more in a tick. <music> 
Our special guest is Martin Hasey. Martin, there's one question that I think everyone wants answered or some information on, and that's how do we in business get out of the COVID bubble that we've been in for so long? One answer, one word to that, and it's called vaccinations. I've had mine. The business community are united in terms of uh, if we get as many Australians vaccinated as possible, as soon as possible, we can ease the restrictions, hopefully have no more lockdowns. COVID might be with us for years to come, and that's just a reality, but if we're vaccinated, we're better prepared for it. Well, it's like the flu injection that, that many of us now just take for granted that we go and get, you know, March, April of the year, and maybe that's the future, do you think? Very as much well, so. Very as much well so. as getting them now so for the future. You know, we've ultimately got to get the state borders reopened. Yep. And I think at some point after that, clearly the international borders will reopen. But if we look at parts of Europe and the like, they are actually already rapidly returning to quote-unquote normal. So uh, Australia in many ways is actually a little bit of a laggard and not a leader at this point. But notwithstanding, the health management's been good. South Australians clearly have been very safe. We've been very lucky. But the business community really does want to get back to business. Yes, I feel very sorry for the Victorians who are still struggling again and certainly for those in New South Wales. But the reality is we've been told to do something here and we've done it and we're now out and about doing what we need to do again, fortunately. Very true. Mm. Martin, thank you so much. We could go on talking Viva because there's so many subjects that you can talk about but I have one very important question. What do you want to do when you grow up? I ask myself that question very often, I must say. Um, I'd like to finish my book. Yes. I said that at the very beginning about the book. Talk about the book. We've got a few seconds left. I am fascinated by people who reinvent themselves. I, I'm mildly obsessed by it. So I've been kind of for some years now writing this book which is learning from others in terms of how they have successfully reinvented themselves time and time oh, again. Right. Yes. And I want to publish that. Do you think this others. is the ages of man that as we age or mankind or person kind or whatever the proper thing is now, um, do you think it's how we mentally change our attitude? Like we start with great ambition and that's somewhat thwarted as it happened in your case a little bit and then you become more comfortable with stuff and you move on? I think it's very difficult when you're young to be able to script exactly where you're going to go. Mm. But I think your attitude and your disposition has a lot to do with where you end up. So I love reading, I love dealing with people, watching people, learning from people and it's all going to come together in this book. So when I grow up, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> Excellent. And we're going to have to say goodbye for now, so keep yourself nice until we see you next time. Martin, thank you so much for chatting with us. Um, not only when you grow up, but what's your next big achievement, do you think? I'm very focused now on really supporting the business community. It's a big job because we're supporting thousands of businesses.